Today, let's look at five ways to challenge yourself if you're a victim of emotional incest. Hang on. So if you're new to this channel, you'll see I've done a lot of videos about emotional incest. There's plenty for you to catch up on if you're curious about what it's about or perhaps you're a victim of emotional incest yourself. And I cover many facets of it. Today I want to cover the facet of ways to challenge yourself if you yourself are a victim of emotional incest. So in today's video, I looked at my own life, my own childhood, and I just sort of pondered what have been some of the biggest issues in my life, and that's how I compose this list. But with that said, I think we can apply it to most victims who have been emotionally smothered out there. So the number one challenge is feel uncomfortable. Tolerate uncomfortable feelings. Now, somebody watching this may say, oh, that's not a big deal. That won't be that hard. Yes, it is. When you're constantly in a people pleaser mode and being there to, in essence, serve the parent, serve the one who's taking you over, you get really good at sort of hiding and dodging uncomfortable feelings because you weren't allowed to have your own uncomfortable feelings, right? You couldn't really own yourself with your parents. You had to mirror back to them what they wanted. So you got really good at dismissing your feelings. Well, in being a people pleaser, then that means we know you're not in touch with or willing to feel a lot of discomfort because that means you can't necessarily be a people pleaser. So you're getting pulled out of your role, right? It's going to feel uncomfortable. You may have to say something where it causes conflict or something where you feel very uncomfortable. It's causing you anxiety to say this. You're actually having your own opinion and guess what? People are disagreeing with you. If you've been raised by a narcissistic parent, especially, it's all about their needs. So you're trained at a very young age that your needs don't really matter. And now I'm suggesting that you challenge yourself on that, which means you're going to feel all topsy-turvy inside. And by tolerating uncomfortable feelings, even though that may seem sort of simple, no, it's not. If you're feeling a lot of fear or anxiety or deep rage with somebody, especially a parent, well, remember, you're not supposed to show that. Not only will you have to verbalize that and put your feelings into words, but in doing that, it can just grate at you. Lots of anxiety, a churning stomach, sweating, maybe even like panic attacks, wondering why the heck am I here right now? Wanting to run away, which is what you were good at as a child. I know for me personally, because I didn't want to be seen, right? Victims of emotional incest, you just kind of want to be invisible. You're the wallflower. You don't want to rock the boat. You always feel like you're walking on eggshells anyhow. Well, as an adult and in college, especially, I had a really hard time being seen, meaning I hated getting up and giving speeches. Oh my gosh. I just had complete terror in me. Well, back then I didn't really know what it was about. I just thought, well, I'm afraid of public speaking. Well, through therapy and as I got older, I realized it didn't really have anything to do necessarily with public speaking in and of itself. It's because I so denied my identity and who I was and didn't understand myself that being in front of people, all of a sudden there was nowhere to hide, right? I just, I was on full display and I wasn't used to that due to my childhood. That meant I actually had to have an opinion. That meant I actually had to say something here and there's a group of people in the class watching me. That means I had to have a point of view or stand for something. Well, I, I wasn't used to that. So of course I felt terrified. So how do you work with something like that and make yourself feel uncomfortable? Well, you better damn well start doing the things that you're afraid of. So for me, for about two years roughly, I went to Toastmasters. Toastmasters is an international group with chapters all over the place where you go and you practice public speaking. It's very supportive and it's wonderful. You can make a lot of friends there and so on. But the most important thing is every week, if you want to, you get up and you speak in front of others. And that's how I worked with the fear. And I hated it and I didn't want to go, but you have to challenge yourself in these ways. And remember, feel the fear and do it anyway. Otherwise, you're not going to grow and overcome a lot of the problematic areas that you've carried with you since childhood. Challenge number two is set up healthy boundaries with everyone in your life, especially with friends and loved ones, and most importantly, your parents. So you need to begin practicing having healthy boundaries because you weren't allowed to have healthy boundaries with your own parents. They removed any essence of a healthy boundary with you. That's what emotional smothering is all about. So you're not used to that. So as an adult, you have to begin practicing that. 
So you're aware of your space and whatever that means to you. You're aware that there's a you there. You're aware that you can stand up for yourself. You're aware that that enmeshment is not going to come in so much and just take you over because now you're learning how to have healthy boundaries. And that can include up to and including no contact with your parents if you feel that's necessary. Sometimes I see in my private practice as a marriage family therapist that you just can't make progress with certain kinds of parents. It's just not going to happen. And so maybe they have brought the parent in for family counseling and that particular parent who did the emotional smothering is just not getting it. They're just not going to go there. They're going to be the way they are for the rest of their life. And it can be extremely toxic depending on how you were raised, depending on your family dynamics. Well, for toxic parents like that, it's sayonara. You have to cut them off if you need to because they don't know who they are probably without consuming you. So part of their identity is based on the fact that they have this little mini husband or mini wife with them, you, and now you're cutting that off and they're going to rebel against that. So let them rebel against it and hopefully that emotional trauma that they're in now will propel them to go seek some therapy, but that's their business, that's up to them. You need to set up the boundary of having the no contact with them to get the wheels going on this. And this will especially apply to people, friends perhaps, coworkers that have narcissistic traits. Because chances are the parent who took you over had narcissistic traits. Because in order to take a child over, usually you have to have a bit of narcissism. You have to feel like you're the kingpin. It's all about you. And that belief allows you then to emotionally smother one of your own children, setting up perhaps lifetime trauma for them. But they don't really care because it's all about them. That's the narcissistic part. And also for people who talk too much, and I did a video about this. If you want to look that up, I'll put a link to it in the description box below. But oftentimes people who are really good about rambling on about themselves, just talking and talking and talking. In fact, the video I did is called Toxic Talking. Well, they love to have victims of emotional incest around them, usually because we're really good listeners. So you don't want to be tolerating that and you're going to have to set up a healthy boundary with people who are just yakking at you. Challenge number three is if you're an adult and you're dating or in a relationship or perhaps you're married and you already have children, be very aware of not being overly enmeshed with them. Everybody has separate identities, right? We all have our own identity and in our own healthy identity, that's what we bring to a healthy relationship. It's two people that have healthy identities that can stand on their own and then they bring that together in a loving way. That's a healthy relationship. Not two weak people who have not done work on themselves and who don't understand themselves bringing this wounded part to somebody in a relationship and hoping that somehow the relationship or the other person is going to fix them. That's never going to work. And also with that, be aware of loving in just a black or white way. Victims of emotional incest are very good at that because that's how we were trained. That's what our parent did to us. We couldn't really be authentic. We weren't really loved for who we are. So what we learned is that we had to put on a facade and act a performance, if you will, for that parent who is teaching us as a child that love means it's how you perform. And so that's very black and white, right? Those are sort of extremes. I'm not hearing anything in the gray area there, right? It's either this way or that way that that's what you're learning from the parent. Well, that's so opposite of what healthy love is all about. Healthy love is about kind of stepping into that murky gray area where things are sort of messy sometimes and a bit unclear. And in that is how we love somebody. We love them through the good and through the bad. So when they start dating or getting serious with somebody, they're very black and white. They can either turn it on or turn it off. So the black and white, the polarity part of them is a red flag. And so challenge yourself with allowing things to be murky and stepping into the gray area. Number four is be selfish with yourself. Feel what that feels like. Put yourself first. You're going to battle it at first. You're not going to think you're worth it, that you're worthwhile enough to put yourself first because you're so used to being at the bottom of the totem pole, right? So you're learning that there's an I there. You're trying to work with the self-loathing, the self-criticism that comes to children of being a victim of emotional incest. Because if you're getting these subconscious messages, which all kids do, that you're not good enough, you have to just 
perform for mommy or daddy because we don't really really want to know who you really truly are we just want you to be what we want you to be then a kid believes in essence that there's something wrong with me but and this is a very unconscious level usually there must be something wrong with me because my own mom or dad doesn't seem to really want to know who i really am so then that's when the self-criticism and the self-loathing can start so to work with that to challenge yourself you have to begin putting yourself first doing a lot of self-care. Pendulum has been over so much on this side for all of your childhood for sure in the emotional smothering that now we want to bring the pendulum back to this side. Now eventually it's going to find that happy medium, right? But for a while we need to bring the pendulum back so you begin to know just what it feels like to put yourself first. You may not even know or have a concept that that's okay. And the last challenge, number five, is let people know, share, talk, let people know the void, the emptiness, the confusion in you in regards to being emotionally smothered by a parent. So this is real, right? There's no shame about it, even though victims carry a lot of shame and guilt and they just want to hide, but they didn't do anything wrong. It's the parent who did something wrong, if we want to use that term. The parent had no business taking you over for their own needs, but now as you're growing up, you feel shame for it, like you've done something wrong. Well, you didn't, you didn't do anything wrong at all. So as an adult, you can talk about it, tell people what it was like for you being raised that way. Discuss the symptoms that it brought on. I know for me, I had some issues with an eating disorder for a while. And in doing that and showing your vulnerable side and showing that authentic, honest side, which you're not used to, right? You couldn't be authentic. So in showing that authentic side is how then you'll gain and be with a partner who you have a wonderful, healthy relationship with because they know you for who you are. And of course, you're going to know them for who they are. And who you are includes a part of you that came from a source of emotional pain when you were younger. Nothing wrong with that. The main thing is that you're working on it now and challenging yourself. And in this regard, I did a video about Karen Carpenter and how she suffered in her life and how she died of an eating disorder, being an anorexic. And if you delve into her life and look at the information out there, I think there's a really good chance that she's a victim of emotional incest. When you look into the relationship she had with her mother, for example, there's some obvious signs that there was some covert incest going on. So assuming that's true, I did this video about it. You can check it out. But once again, we see how she suffered in her life because of that, how it affected her self-esteem, her self-image. And then when she became famous, it just was simply too much for her. She ran to food as a way to control things, which is really what an eating disorder is all about anyhow. And of course, that eventually took her life. So I wish that she could be hearing this video back in the mid 70s or whenever, because I would encourage her, if she was open to hearing this, to talk about her life, to talk about those feelings of emptiness, of being lost, of a lot of confusion and complicated feelings, feelings that you're not even sure where they're coming from. But the more we probe into that and go into that is how we in fact heal from all that because we're letting it up and we're willing to look at it. The more we keep a lid over these things, the more it's going to get bigger and it'll be the big elephant in the room that's eventually going to consume you as opposed to you working with it and talking about it. So I hope these five challenges have been helpful for some of you out there. Please let me know what you think about these five that I've come up with. Write some comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Please subscribe to my mental health YouTube channel if you like these kind of videos. And until next week, this is Brad Shore signing off from Ask a Shrink.